All right. Hello, everyone. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for tonight's hybrid presentation, Analysis of Fall 2020 Bird Mortality Event. Before we get started, I want to make sure everyone is aware that this presentation is being recorded. I am Ashley Lusher, the Gift Shop and Program Coordinator at the Pajarito Environmental Education Center, or PEAK, located in Los Alamos, New Mexico. I will be your moderator for tonight's talk. I also want to say this is a hybrid talk. So we have some friends here in the room with us and some online over Zoom. Zoom friends, can somebody just give me a thumbs up in the chat so I know you are here and you can hear me? I'll keep an eye on that. Oh, looks like we have people saying they can hear. Perfect. Um, so before we get started, can you, Jenna, can you go to the next slide for me? All right, Peak is a nonprofit organization that operates the Los Alamos Nature Center, which is open from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Mondays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. Visit our website, peaknature.org, to learn more about the Nature Center and our upcoming events. We are able to offer programmings at this time because of our wonderful members and donors, so I'd like to send a special shout out to you for your generous support. To learn more about becoming a Peak member or donor, visit peaknature.org or grab a membership brochure on your way out. Now, a bit about tonight's speaker. Jenna has worked with an, as an ecologist for the Los Alamos Nat National Laboratory since 2018. Prior to that, she worked as a wildlife biologist for a nonprofit research organization in California for eight years. She earned her MS in Wildlife and Fisheries Biology from Clemson University, a BS in Biology and Ecology from Western State Colorado University, and a BA in Environmental Policy and Spanish at Albright College. Jenna, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'll turn this over to you now and be monitoring the chat for questions. Okay, well, thanks for having me. Um, I'm not sure if this remote works. Wait, maybe it does. Okay. So I'll be talking today about using fall bird banding data to provide insight into avian health during fall migration. After the large avian mortality event that occurred in New Mexico in the fall of 2020, my colleagues and I decided to look at our fall bird banding data from two locations in north central New Mexico to investigate the influence of drought on avian health. This presentation is an overview of our peer-reviewed published paper um, from those results, but if you'd like to read about the results in detail, you can find it under this title in the journal Animals from this year. And I just wanna acknowledge my awesome co-authors listed here, Brent Thompson, Sarah Milgan, Keegan Tranquillo, Steve Bedick, and Chuck Halcock. As you all may remember, in the fall of 2020, a cold weather event that was preceded by poor summer precipitation led to a large bird die-off in New Mexico. The die-off was attributed to poor air quality from wildfire smoke on North America's west coast and extreme fluctuating weather patterns, with record highs on September 6th and 7th, followed by record early snow on September 9th and record cold for the season on September 9th and 10th. Some estimates suggest that upwards of 1 million birds, Ashley's messing with, with the, oh, is it okay? <laughs> um, some estimates suggest that upward of 1 million birds died in this event across five states in the southwestern United States. Many of the birds were collected and submitted to the United States Geological Survey's National Wildlife Health Center to determine the cause of death. The only consistent impacts to all of the birds were a high level of breakdown of muscle tissue in the breast meat, low or non-existent fat, and general emaciated conditions. With the decreased fat reserves, most of these birds likely died from hypothermia. Um, a recently published paper by Yang et al. examined spatiotemporal patterns at a high level and suggested that birds that were already stressed because of drought conditions could be more prone to other factors, including distance to wildfire and air quality. 
Because this large mortality event occurred during our fall bird banding season in 2020, we were interested to see if our bird condition data would reflect the conditions identified by the National Wildlife Health, Health Center and if these conditions were related to drought. We hypothesized that insectivorous migratory birds would be most affected by drought conditions. Therefore, our research questions were, are more severe local drought conditions associated with avian body health conditions and are migratory insectivorous birds more at risk to increase drought severity? You can see my mouth, can't you? Is that where you're, no? Okay. We conducted this study with data from 2010 to 2020 and from two locations in North Central New Mexico, with one being in a large wetlands complex at Los Alamos National Laboratory and another at a higher elevation site at Bandelier National Monument. These fall bird banding operations have occurred regularly since 2010 with the goal to learn about the species diversity and quantity of birds using these sites during their fall migration period, which is a critical part of a bird's annual life cycle. During these bird banding sessions, we collect data on birds captured, including species, age, sex, and amount of fat. We get amongst other things. <laughs> We gave birds uh, a standardized fat score based on the amount of fat we saw, and we used fat score data from over 15,000 individual birds to assess whether drought indices, residency, diet, or age influenced avian health. We used multiple logistic regression to assess the relative health of birds based on fat score. We grouped the response variable of fat score as either none, which was equal to zero, and then all other fat categories were grouped together and made equal to one. Studies have shown that fat scores throughout the annual life cycle are higher during fall migration, and we therefore hypothesized that a migrant could be deemed as in better physiological condition if they had a fat score that was greater than zero during fall migration. We also chose to group the data in this manner to avoid zero inflation problems in the statistical analyses, to standardize the subjectivity of the data and to evenly distribute the response variable terms because approximately half of the fat scores were categorized as none. The birds in our data set um, were aligned with those found during the fall mortality event. Of the most common migratory bird species in our data set, 19 of 22 were species reported in the 2020 mortality event, while 11 of 12 of the most common year-round residents were species reported in the 2020 mortality event. So we felt like we had a good representation of the species. For analyses, we used averages from December through August from 2009 to 2020 of local Palmer drought severity index data, which I'll be referring to as PDSI. We use this data from New Mexico Climate Division Region 2, shown here in this figure. The Palmer Drought Severity Index uses readily available temperature and precipitation data to estimate relative dryness. It's a standardized index that spans from negative 10, dry, to positive 10, which is wet, and zero is normal. This index has been reasonably successful at quantifying long-term drought. PDSI data are all publicly available. We investigated avian health measured as having some quantity of fat or not having any fat at all in relation to the local drought severity, migratory or resident status, different feeding groups, so what they eat, and age. In the fall, most birds can only be aged as having been born that same breeding season or having been born in a previous breeding season and we call these hatch year and after hatch year respectively. So you'll see that in this next graph. This figure is for results for the migratory birds only. So the birds that we deemed as birds that make long distance migrations. And it shows the probability of a positive fat score on the Y axis from zero to one and the drought severity index scores on the X axis. And you'll remember that a PDSI of zero is a normal year and positive numbers are wetter years while negative numbers are drier years. The left figure is for older birds. 
that were born previous to the year captured. So it's labeled AHY, meaning after hatch year. And the right graph is for younger birds born that same year of capture, HY or hatch year birds. For diet, we have, um, we group them as insectivores, omnivores, or granivores. Insectivores eat mainly insects, omnivores eat insects and seeds, other things, and granivores eat mainly seeds. You can see that insectivorous birds shown with the red lines on this graph had a higher probability of receiving a fat score greater than zero as the local drought index values increased, indicating wetter conditions. Compare this with omnivores and granivores, which in our results were not significantly affected by local drought conditions, statistically speaking anyways. You can see that the aforementioned patterns on diet are consistent between the younger and the older birds, where insectivores of both age groups were affected by local drought, but younger birds had a significantly lower probability of receiving a positive fat score compared to older birds. Here's the same figure. Now this is just year round resident birds. So those birds that we deemed as not making long distance migrations. The probability of a positive fat score on the y-axis and uh, is on the y-axis and the PDSI values are again on the x-axis. Although resident birds showed similar patterns as migratory birds in terms of diet and age in relation to drought severity, you can see that the slope of the line for insectivores is smaller and the probability of receiving a positive fat score was less influenced by drought severity. And this result, in my mind, at least makes sense since resident birds don't need to put on uh, fat to fuel long distance migrations or as much. Our results suggest that body health conditions of migrants measured as having fat or not having any fat were more affected by drought severity. Insectivores in particular of all ages were less likely to have a fat score greater than zero as drought severity levels increased and younger birds, whether migrants or residents, also had a significantly lower probability of receiving a positive fat score as drought severity levels increased. So the big take home message is that migratory insectivores may be less resilient to drought. This follows the logic that migratory birds need to maintain fat reserves to power their migration, where local resident birds do not. Additionally, starvation due to drought and insect decline may make migrants more susceptible to wildfire smoke and extreme weather events, especially for young birds that lack experience in migration pathways. Drought-related climate change and climate variability um, is gonna be increasing in the future, has, and it has the potential to shift migration timing and patterns for migratory birds. Identifying these migratory pathways and the stopover habitat for any known declining species could help to identify these shifts and also to pinpoint locations where habitat conservation or enhancement may benefit migrants. Stopover sites along migratory pathways provide crucial resources, including food that fuels long haul flights, safe places to roost and rest, and somewhere to ride out unfavorable conditions during migration. If finer scale migratory pathways and stopover sites of specific species of concern are identified, the habitat quantity and quality within identified migratory pathways could be enhanced by creating sanctuaries of stopover habitat for migrants to refuel, and of course, continuing to protect known existing bird migration pathways and stopover sites is also crucially important. There are some technologies out there that can help identify specific migratory pathways and stopover habitat, including satellite and GPS tags. Um, some of these things, the bird has to weigh a certain amount in order to attach them. Uh, there's also MODIS networks, which the tag is a lot smaller and you can attach them to more things, including monarch butterflies. There's also genomic technology such as the Bird Genoscape Project, where researchers gather genetic data from feathers collected during bird banding sessions. So at our bird banding station and also at Bandelier, um, we participate in that project. By extracting DNA from the feathers, scientists can map bird migration with greater precision than ever before. It's 
really fascinating, actually. I was going to share a video with you at the end of this talk. Especially for small songbirds, the bird genoscape and the MODIS network may be the best options to learn about specific migratory pathways and species survivorship, too. So MODIS tags, as I mentioned, are tiny and lightweight, and you don't actually have to tag birds to have a MODIS station. The MODIS wildlife tracking uses coordinated automated radio telemetry arrays to study movements of birds, bats, and even insects, as I mentioned. Um, so I don't know if you've seen the radio telemetry units that you use for wildlife tracking, but it's basically the same thing, but it'll be on top of a building or on top of a tower, things like that. The Eastern United States has a large established array of MODA stations while the West Coast has just recently started expanding location. Um, and the expansions actually currently being spearheaded by the Partners in Flight Western Working Group. And if you wanna see a map of all the current MODIS locations and some additional information, you can visit these websites I have here. I'm gonna share this PowerPoint. Um, if you all want it, you can have those. Um, but anyway, I took a screenshot of the MODIS locations in New Mexico. And although keep in mind, this may not be 100% up to date currently, but New Mexico doesn't have many. Um, it's the yellow dots really on there. The black dots are ones that have gone out um, of use. And um, New Mexico does have the opportunity to expand the MODIS network, potentially hosting locations along the Rio Grande, which is a huge migratory pathway. And it also be great information to do a, a strategy similar to what um, Pennsylvania did where they, Pennsylvania actually located MODIS networks from east to west to create kind of a bottleneck to, so birds you know, had to fly through and they would read the tags so they could gather data on all the tag birds that migrated north to south and the timing on that, who was migrating. So our research isn't the only publication out there that expresses concern for migratory insectivorous birds. Scientific research has been mounting across the continent that bird numbers have plummeted, even among common species. I don't know if any of you um, are familiar with the publication that came out recently in 2018 in the world's leading scientific journal, Science, um, but the findings showed that the bird populations have declined by 2.9 billion breeding adult birds since 1970, including birds in every ecosystem. So it was estimated from that publication that in less than a single human lifetime, North America has lost more than one in four of its birds. The report estimated a 28% decrease in migratory birds since 1970 and a 32% decrease in aerial insectivorous birds since 1970. But I don't wanna end on a depressing note um, because there are real actions that us as individuals can all take in our everyday lives to help birds. Um, because that publication came out, the three billion birds lost, um, there's been a big campaign to try to create actions and get people on board with doing these things just in their everyday lives. So um, this is from the three billion birds um, campaign, bring back birds, seven simple actions we can do. And I think all bird scientists can probably agree on these. We can make windows safer day and night. Up to 1 billion birds are estimated to die each year after hitting windows in the United States and Canada. So by day, birds perceive reflections in glass as habitat, and they can they fly into it. By night, migratory birds are drawn in by city lights, and they're at risk of getting off track or colliding with buildings. And you can help with this issue by installing screens, um, pulling down your blinds at night, um, and then breaking up reflections on the outside of the window. You can use film, paint. Um, they have these things called a copium bird savers, or, uh, which are essentially just key cord hanging at um, two inch intervals uh, along the window. So Google a copium bird savers and you'll see what I mean. Um, or you can do any other string that stays no more than two inches high um, or two inches wide. They do make windows that are rated as more bird safe that have kind of fancy designs in them, or they have um, like ultraviolet 
designs in them that, you know, if a human's looking out the window, they don't see that, but the birds can see it, but they're expensive and that technology is still emerging. Um, I know that from things that I've read, the, <laughs> the space string hanging on your window is actually much more effective um, and a lot cheaper. We can keep cats indoors. Cats are estimated to kill more than 2.6 billion birds annually in the US and Canada. These non-native predators instinctively hunt and kill birds even when they're well-fed. We can plant natives. Uh, lawns and pavement don't offer enough food or shelter for many birds and other wildlife. With more than 40 million acres of lawn in the US alone, there's huge potential to support wildlife by replacing at least a portion of lawn with, with native plantings. Avoiding pesticides is really important. The continent's most widely used insecticides called neonicotinoids or neonics are lethal to birds and to the insects that birds consume. Uh, I just recently kind of converted on this one, drink coffee that's good for birds. Three quarters of the world's coffee farms grow their plants in the sun, destroying forests that birds and other wildlife need for food and shelter, especially on their non-breeding grounds. If you look for shade-grown bird-friendly coffee, there's actually a certification from the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center that also includes organic standards. Um, and you can actually sign up for it to get it just delivered monthly or however often you drink coffee. We can protect our planet from plastics, avoid single-use plastics, including bags, bottles, wraps, disposable utensils. I'm sure I'm just preaching to the choir on this one, but it's far better to choose reusable items. But if you do have to use disposable plastic, try to recycle it. And then of course, watching the birds and sharing what you see, which is the fun part, right? To understand how birds are faring, scientists need hundreds of thousands of people to report what they're seeing in backyards, neighborhoods, and wild places around the world. And scientists and researchers do use this data. I mean, it, it gets used. You can join a project such as eBird, Project Feeder Watch, a Christmas bird count, breeding bird surveys, and record your observations. And your contributions will provide valuable information to show where birds are thriving and where they might need more help. So for more detail and resources on each of these actions, you can visit um, that website I have there. Maybe we can try to link it in the chat. I didn't give it to Ashley though, so maybe I can't. <laughs> um, and that's all I have. I just wanna give a big shout out to all of the interns, technicians, volunteers, and staff at Bandelier National Monument and Los Alamos National Lab who've helped in this long-term study. And also a big thank you to my management in the Environmental Protection and Compliance Division at LANL for supporting this work. Um, I can take any questions that you might have for me and hopefully I can answer them. All right, just a quick reminder, Jenna, to repeat any questions you're asked so that our online Zoom audience can hear those. Okay, we have a few that. questions here in the audience and we also have at least one question over Zoom. Hi. Um, yes, I mean, there were, okay, so the question is, didn't, me personally, oh, me personally go up to Taos and see a bunch of dead birds. I did not personally go up to Taos and see a bunch of dead birds, but there were birds really all over the Southwest, um, bird mortality at different days and events, but in New Mexico, those days I was talking about September 9th, 10th, I guess, yeah, where they had a, a lot of mortalities. I mean, just like birds falling from the sky, apocalyptic type stuff. Um, and uh, my friend who lives in, Di or my coworker who lives in Dixon, that's what she was saying. I know Taos got some, but those birds, um, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them did get collected and sent off to to be tested for to see what was killing the birds. Because when it first started happening, you know, people didn't really know: is it a disease? Is something going on? Yep. That was not me, but that was other concerned 
scientist. Um, I think there were people at um, New Mexico University and at NMSU. I mean, I think a lot of people collected and sent in dead bird samples. It was a whole project on um, my naturalist, actually, the avian mortality project, and people were submitting data that way. And there was a bunch of different um, pathways, but mm -hmm. but I did not personally go up. But I did find dead birds, and we did submit them. All right, we have a question from Zoom. Could fires have caused some birds to shift their normal migratory paths away from the fires through New Mexico? Uh, and longer migration pathways have impacted bird health and fat storage? 2020 was a terrible year for fires. Absolutely. And um, I mentioned the one publication came out by Yang et al. And he goes into that. Um, he looked at a larger spatial scale all across the West, looking at air quality and fires and how that might have shifted migration. And one of his determinations was that drought induced um, these birds not to be as healthy and not to be able to adapt to um, the fires and moving around. But I mean, there's lots of hypotheses out there what exactly happened, but Honestly, I think it was a combination probably of all those factors, because if you go back and look, this wasn't the driest year. 2020 wasn't the driest year on record. You can see the red uh, figures there. That's showing the average PDSI from December through August from 2009 to 2020. And when we went back and looked at you know, data, I, I researched like, oh, well, was there a die off event in 2013? Is this something that's really, really tied to drought? There wasn't a die off event like that in 2013. So these birds are already stressed. And yeah, the wild, absolutely, the wildfires could have pushed them out of where they would normally go. They had to go farther around. You know, they didn't get to refuel as much because the, they had to go so far around or they couldn't find the resources. Uh huh. And then the cold weather hit. So all these different factors, I think, impacted it. Yep. Uh, another question. What was the bird on the last photo in your presentation? A violet green swallow. It's beautiful down in Sandia wetlands. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful male. Mm hmm few other questions. Are migratory birds being banded in better conditions this year? Yes, actually, it's really funny. And maybe I'm biased now because I analyzed the data, but I'm like, oh yeah, fat score is a three. Fat, this bird looks so fat. But even last year, we're like, oh, this this is um, not, not great fat scores. But yeah, I'm probably a little biased. But I do think if I pulled in that data and looked at the data, it probably would fall similarly in line with what we were already seeing from the previous 10 years. Okay, so the question is, um, have we seen decreases in quantities in relation to drought, like abundance? We haven't looked at that data. I haven't, I don't know. I mean, observationally, I don't, I, I don't know. Maybe the dry years have less abundance. It'd be a good hypothesis to test, though, to look at the data. Yeah. I would love all those places to put up MODIS stations. It might be a little more complicated. Atlanta would definitely have to go through a lot of approvals and get the OKs and onboard for it and everything. Um, but I. The other places that could put up something like, I'm sorry, my, your thought, I turned off my phone. Um, the other, I didn't repeat the question, did I? Oh, okay. So um, the question is, could MODIS towers be put up in these migratory hotspots or even Atlanta, um, like Bosque del Apache, Las Vegas National Wildlife Refuge? What was it, Maxwell? Um, let me see this map. I, yeah, I'd have to go to the website, but Maxwell does seem familiar. It might be, but I'd love for him to be like along the Rio Grande. 
So there's debate right now about what that yellow point, where that actually is, <laughs> what that location is. Um, but yeah, it'd be fantastic to, to have um, some MODIS towers or MODIS stations, they call them, put up there. Um, about $5,000 to put up if you have um, electricity and a Wi-Fi single signal. It doesn't need a Wi-Fi or electricity. The MODIS station can be battery powered with solar panel set up and data can be collected on an SD card, but then someone has to go visit the location, upload the data. Um, we could put one on peak. They have Wi-Fi and electricity. <laughs> if electricity and Wi-Fi are available, it's only approximately $1,000 to be placed on an existing structure, such as on a building, and then it can be attached to pre-existing pre structures. It has a 10-mile line of sight, so you do want it to be in a location that would have a line of sight, um, like if a bird's flying by. Um, yes, question. I'm sure it's not a silly question. Okay, the silly question is, do I think I may have been a bird in a prior life? I think I might have been a dragonfly. I love dragonflies. They migrate too, you know. Okay. You're welcome. Um, on Zoom, our question is, how harmful are the tall fences used by baseball and golf centers to birds? How harmful are the tall fences used? Oh, like the mesh part of them? I, I guess so. Yeah, the just tall fences used by, I assume, baseball fields and golf courses, golf ranges. Um, so I would, I don't know. I I don't know. I would think they'd be able to see them, but I don't want to speak for the birds. You can see that our mist nets, I'm sure you guys have probably seen mist nets, but they are hard to see. They're meant to catch the birds. Um, but an, a problem, another problem for birds that is something that people don't always think about is the tops of open pipes for our cavity nesting birds if the top of the open pipe, even on buildings and houses, fence posts, if the top is open, birds will go in there and then they cannot get back out and they die a slow death in there. It's quite awful. We've, um, we've taken, or in my previous job, we took endoscopes to look down into the pipes and it's just like bones, it, it's terrible. So if you see an open top pipe, take a rock, put it on there, make sure it fits and we'll blow off. That's a quick fix, yeah. Yeah, they, uh, birds can go in them, yes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so some kind of mesh on top or they actually, so the question is, I'm sorry for people on Zoom. The question is the open top pipes on houses for venting those can also um, have birds that go in them and you can get uh, things that, that go on top, which will still allow it to vent, but not allow anything to get in. It's tricky to find the right size though. <laughs> yes. They're coming. They're having a crane festival, and um, the participant wants to know if I can give a similar talk down there about about this data. Oh, about lowering bird mortality. Um, sure, you'll have to talk to me afterwards about dates. But yeah, I mean, I, I think the, one of the main things is, you know, those seven actions, and I, I really do encourage you to share this um with anyone who might be interested or people who might not be interested i don't know the seven simple actions that you can do because they really are things that can be simple um i guess it's all relative but um i think they can be simple and even just being aware that right now is migration time birds are migrating a lot of migrants are migrating right now i mean when it 
when the sun goes down, I close all my blinds. You know, I turn off lights that aren't necessary just so I'm not putting out a, a bunch of light. I know Los Alamos is in a huge city, but I don't know, the lights could distract them or attract them, get them off track. Any more questions? We have about four more questions over Zoom. Okay. Did they find some infectious disease in the birds that died in the large bird mortality event that might have weakened them through the drought? They did not find any infectious disease. Well, I, I actually, I can't say that they didn't find any infectious disease, but the thing that they found that was the common thread amongst all the birds, I'll go back a slide because I have it in my notes, um, taken directly from uh, what they did find. The only consistent impacts to all the birds were a high level of breakdown of muscle tissue in the breast meat, low or non-existent fat, and general emaciated conditions. With the de and their determination was, and this is from the USGS National Wildlife Health Center, from all those birds that were donated by, you know, people who were collecting them and sending them off to be tested. With the decreased fat reserves, most of these birds likely died from hypothermia because we had that really cold weather event. We had record warm and then record cold. So it was almost like, I don't know, maybe some birds were like, oh, it's time I'm gonna migrate, it's nice and warm. And then it was freezing cold. I don't know what kind of bird, but yeah, bad timing with all those events. Someone over Zoom says, 40 to 50 years ago, eagles were common around Los Alamos. Now it is very rare to see them. Why might that be? Bald eagles? Uh, it does not specify Golden the eagle? species of eagle. Well, that's interesting. Um, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I mean, all I can do is have hypotheses, but my first thing is, the first thing I always think of when I hear about a population decreasing is what does it eat? <laughs> um, and is that resource being affected or is it still here? So bald eagles eat fish. I don't know. Golden eagles eat whatever they want because they're so big. I don't really know, <laughs> actually. Uh, another sure. good question on Zoom. How do you measure bird fat? Oh, that's a very good question. So this uh, picture here on the bottom left, you have the bird secured in your hand uh, safely. And then you blow on the bird to expose its breast and there's a cavity right where its neck is. And that is usually where the fat starts being stored first. So you blow in there and you look for kind of like yellowish colored trace and, and that's the fat. And if a bird's, so then there's different standardized scores of what score you give the bird based on what you're seeing. So if you're just seeing a trace amount of fat, then that's a score of one. Um, if you're, I'd have to have it all in front of me, but as that uh, part fills up, like it can actually be full and bulging if the bird is really fat. Um, and then if it's that fat, then it's gonna have fat pretty much everywhere else. Like you'll see it kind of on the flanks and even the back and yeah, just like a yellow fatty adipose tissue. <laughs> All right, we have one final, final question okay. over Zoom. Have wind turbines in some areas of New Mexico impacted migrating birds? When wind turbines are planned, are migratory pathways of birds and bats considered? Oh, that's a good question. I am not the person to answer it because, I mean, I think they are considered. I think maybe wind turbines want to be put in places where there's good uh, wind and which is also probably places that are good for migrating but I don't really know for sure 
and I'm sure there are some assessments because there is the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, um, but I don't know the full processes. So I am not the right person to ask, I'm sorry. Well, thank you so much, Jenna, You're for welcome. answering all of our questions. I believe you had a video you wanted to show the audience. I do have audience. a video because I was telling you guys about the bird genoscape and um, how we participate in it. So it's a really big project now, but um, what we do is we just collect, we have the birds that we're already collecting data on and we collect two tail feathers of specific birds that they're wanting to analyze the DNA for. And I have a video just explaining that 